Daddy. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Andy Grimes. I'm the cloud services go-to-market lead for AWS. And joining me. And my name is Antoinette Mills, and I am a senior containers go-to-market specialist with AWS. I like to define my superpower as providing performance optimization strategies for customers like yourselves, which usually results in ensuring that your containerized environments run smoothly. <laughs> so, let's go on ahead and let's start off with why containers in the first place, right? So container serves as a, a mechanism for developers to isolate applications and their associated dependencies, right? And across environments. And this usually results in enabling consistency across environments. Those same developers have the option to design only once. And they can execute it from their laptops in a test environment or go directly into production. And this makes it where portability becomes even more essential. Additionally, customers can scale horizontally based on, very, you know, on different workload types um, with containers as well. And our orchestration solutions like Kubernetes um, automate and deploy, or automate deployment and management of containers uh, to scale up or down on demand. So, Kubernetes workloads and first off, thanks, thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first reInvent, so I'm really excited to be here. Can't stop smiling. So Kubernetes workloads um, are a mix of ISV commercial off the shelf, as well as custom uh, developed applications. And OpenShift are used for many of these types of workloads. So at Amazon Web Services, you can run containers on EKS or ECS using an EC2 launch type, or you can leverage serverless with AWS Fargate. We use um, ECS or EKS for orchestration, and we run our managed clusters with ROSA, which is our turnkey application platform. And this managed offering combines OpenShift uh, OpenShift capabilities along with the benefits of AWS platform. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner here, Andy. Thank you. So one of the great things about OpenShift is OpenShift takes the best of the open source project of Kubernetes. And Red Hat, I joke with my friends that one of the reasons why I work at Red Hat is they always ask me, how do you work with free technology and make a living on it? It's like I make it boring. And open source can be a bit of the wild, wild west. What we do with OpenShift is Red Hat pre-integrates these open source projects in something that's now really called platform engineering, which are opinionated sets of tools to help accelerate your developer experience. So we use open source projects like Tekton. We integrate it into the technology, and we have the CICD pipelines pre-integrated. So your developers start with a better experience. They know what they're getting right out of the gate. Um, we're able to do that with GitOps, DevOps, and now, of course, platform engineering is taking up some of that messaging. But uh, recently, just uh, the beginning of November, we re actually released a new capability in ROSA. ROSA is our managed service offering in AWS. It is OpenShift delivered as a managed service. We also added the ability to run virtual machines. So you could run Windows and Linux images inside your container environments and treat them the same way as you do a container. You can do blue-green deployments, automate deployments, life cycle. Um, you can have applications, we call them hybrid applications, that are mixed. They'll have the ability to have um, Windows images along with containers and potentially serverless all in the same platform with the same tools in an opinionated build. Uh, and that gives you much greater um, supportability, reliability, and for particularly for enterprise customers, it's pretty easy to do one open source project. It's hard to do 100 of them. And it's especially hard to do um, support them day 100. Okay. So what is ROSA as a managed service? That's really we take OpenShift that you're used to running in data centers, and we run it in AWS, and we deliver it as a managed service. It's installed through automation, through best practices. Uh, we basically take those dark red items and take them off your plate for managing OpenShift, especially from managing Kubernetes. But the key one there is we will monitor it, manage it, deliver it on a 99.95% SLA back to the business. So you can focus on the containers and the workload, and you don't have to focus on managing all of the open source projects that come. So every time a new version of each open source project delivers, we do the work to integrate that and deliver it back to you in a seamless turnkey fashion. 
Um, one of the big examples of that, um, all you're responsible for is your data, the applications and the developer tools you configure. We'll do the upgrades, we'll keep it up, and we do that 99.95% SLA for you. Um, big user of this is actually Delta Airlines. Uh, Delta did their free Wi-Fi system. One of the nice things they find is Delta has a platform that they can train their developers on in days, not months. So they get a standard, standard delivery a set of tools that they deliver. Uh, they were able to deliver a Wi-Fi system that I actually used on my flights here for 600 aircraft. They developed it in Rosa, then deployed it into the field. Um, we've done similar things, extremely fast product development, because the developers know exactly what they're getting in every situation. Um, we see that in commercial software. It's actually ironic for the same reasons we use containers for custom applications, so are software vendors. They're starting to like that 99.95% SLA. They're liking us making open source boring, but we're seeing even commercial vendors, and in this case, we're showing a lot of IBM software, but there are many others, like MuleSoft, for example. Delivering your software as a container for commercial software is becoming normal but all new development for those applications is in those container versions. So we're seeing a lot of people move from VMs to containers and want to use commercial software, and as that slide showed earlier, about 56% of the time they're using commercial software with something they've developed themselves to augment it. So that's a key benefit is you get a turnkey platform, but you have commercial software that can coexist with a great support paradigm from OpenShift with anything that you build on it from standardized tools. So in fact, IBM did take advantage of this themselves. Much of the IBM software portfolio is being moved to containers. It's easier for IBM to develop and deliver. But more importantly, it's easy for you to consume as well, because you can run it as operators in the platform. So upgrades, future upgrades to the software is an operator upgrade. You're not doing server migrations between generations. You're not doing a large, complex, multi-month project. You can typically get a new implementation of it with new features right away. But IBM delivers all of this software as software as a service on ROSA that you can consume just as a software as a service, or you can run it on your account with the rest of the platform to augment it. And I'll talk about that as a specific example, but we'll talk about Maximo. A lot of people haven't heard of Maximo, but it's actually one of the widest deployed applications in the industry for asset management. It's been around for about 20 to 30 years. I actually have a customer that's hilarious that actually tags me every time I post something on it. He works for the Grand Museum, in uh, Egyptian Museum in Cairo. So I like to joke that Maximo was so old, so old the Egyptians use it. But it's one of those things where the new version of Maximo, and it's a gold standard in infrastructure, in mining, in utilities, like eight out of the top nine utilities use it. Eight out of the nine, not top nine airports use it. So it's everywhere, but they're currently going through a migration from a version seven to a version eight, and the version eight is containerized. They're really liking all the new capabilities you're gonna get in the containerized version, but also future upgrades will be an operator. And so one of the things the new version gives you, built-in AI. You actually have built into it the predictive modeling to do visual scans of assets and predict on what condition they're in, and then run a life cycle through them. Take them through manage, monitor, health, and predict. But you, have, you can train your own visual models to tell you what good is for the asset, what OK is for the asset, what expired for the asset is. And so you can manage everything you own and deliver. So for that Egyptian museum, it might be a mummy. Imagine being able to visually inspect it and see what the condition is. And that's built into the new version to actually train your own models. Um, this is a bit of an eye chart, but it's the architecture that shows you're running the, the, the meat of the application is running on ROSA in a managed service as operators that you can deliver. So it's very, very easy to upgrade and manage and deliver, but you can actually train deep learning models and then publish them out to RHEL edges that use cameras to look at your assets. If that's a vehicle, if that's a mining equipment, uh, whatever heavy equipment you're using, you can train your own models and then deliver it out to edges. This is a very practical implementation of AI that you can take a 30-year-old application and start to add AI capabilities to it by upgrading it to a containerized delivery model. So hopefully this makes sense. Um, Maximo is one of those ones where not a lot of people have heard of it, but almost every company, I, I've got the customer list, there's an amazing number of customers that are running it. And so you'll see you can take legacy software, upgrade it to containers, and then accelerate your use of new technologies, potentially like AI. But more importantly, you're probably going to build other workflows, other applications that are going to look at the data that comes out of it. You're going to flag whatever assets aren't working. Maybe I want to do a data science project to look at those assets in a different way and look at those resources that come in. How can I improve management of that, for example? You're probably going to build a custom application to do that. 
And so that's where we see that app platform uh, available with the commercial software. You're going to do your own web front ends, your own middleware, your own back ends that you're going to customize for your use cases and your business groups. Okay. So key thing we see is there's a, a, a continuum of a journey. You start with your on-prem legacy applications. A lot of these are sitting in virtual machines today. They're sitting in your Linuxes, and they're sitting in your Windows, and they're hard to move to cloud. And when they go to cloud, they run as uh, expensively as possible because you're paying for the maximum version. Uh, I work with IBM MQ software quite a bit. And it's interesting that it does run on EC2, but customers are preferring to run it on ROSA because they know future upgrades of that software are going to be containers. They're going to get new versions of software. They're going to update those operators, and they're going to move on with their lives. But one of the key things here is when you move applications to cloud, you'll see a mix of legacy applications and cloud native. Today, a lot of times, you're stuck moving them to cloud native to migrate to cloud or living with them in the old format and hoping you can fix them later. What ROSA allows you to do, particularly with that virtual machine capability I talked about earlier, is you can bring your Windows applications that have been a boat anchor and then modernize them in stages. You can modernize the front end of it, the middleware of it, the back end of it independently, and you can keep those Windows applications running in the middle of it. We call those hybrid applications, where there's some virtual machines, some containers, and, ones, and some are going to use serverless architectures. So this gives you ability to start with a life cycle. And so we just had a very large customer looking at moving 15,000 Windows.next servers into the cloud and modernizing very rapidly off of that legacy debt so they run more efficiently in AWS. But this ability to move forward and bring cloud native in, we're starting to see the artificial intelligence comes up as well. Not a lot of companies are going to have the, the staff to do your own you know, large, large language model tra training, et cetera. You're going to probably acquire models and acquire details, but you're going to need to build them into your applications. And whether you use our OpenShift uh, for data science, um, at now branded OpenShift AI, um, that's an open source based uh, console for, for AI tools. You know, typical Red Hat, it's built on open source. You can use SageMaker, which I'll talk about in the next slide, to train models. But those models are going to be consumed inside of a cloud-native application that you're going to develop. But you want to be able to create a pipeline where you train a model and put the new version in, train a model and put the new version in, and then maybe tweak the application rapidly. We also see the same thing with Watson X. Um, Watson X was actually announced on ROSA Monday. So we have data governance, the AI studio, and we also have um, uh, the data model governance and the AI studio. And that gives you an end-to-end -end flow. Um, I actually worked at IBM way back in my history. It was interesting back in the old Linux SCO days, if you remember the lawsuits about Linux, IBM actually offered to indemnify the Linux community uh, to continue running Linux. Um, we're actually starting to see IBM do the same thing with the Granite, their models. They're offering governance of those models as well as the ability to indemnify you if you use their models. So that's going to be a key driver for AI adoption and the ability to build them into business processes. But what you're going to see is you're going to be modernizing all of your applications around it because there's a pretty good chance those virtual machines, those Windows virtual, application, virtual machine applications are probably not going to be able to adapt those new AI models you're going to need cloud-native API access. Okay. So this is actually a really interesting one. This is actually a, a public uh, video that we've done uh, with a three-letter government entity. <laughs> it was a public process to actually train a model in SageMaker to do fingerprint identification. Uh, this is actually a GitHub website that you can go look at. And what we did was train the model with NVIDIA and, the, and some workflows. And then we deliver it on um, ROSA. And we deliver the application framework on LOSA is built for that model. So you can use SageMaker to train the model and then deploy the application, lifecycle it with all of the ROSA pieces that are available to you. And then you can deploy it out to edges, whether that's RHEL, whether that's OpenShift out in, the, out in your data centers or out in your locations, manufacturing facilities, or whatever. But uh, this is actually a, a pretty, good pretty cool demo to see. Um, but we actually have all the scripts out there for you to build this for yourself. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and, and kind of wrap this up a little bit, probably a little bit early. Um, the key <laughs> thing here is uh, we really want to look at the ability to modernize commercial applications by taking advantage of the containerization of those, those apps. Um, almost all new software is being delivered in containers because for software manufacturers, it's easier to deliver a container than try to qualify every variety of hardware and OS deliverable. So we're seeing commercial software benefit from containerization, and we're seeing the coexistence up to 56% of the time we will see a container application coexist. 
Uh, we're also seeing the need to rapidly integrate AI into new applications. Those aren't going to go into your legacy virtual machines. Those are going to go into new cloud native models. Um, but we really want you to focus on the innovation, not running Kubernetes for yourself and all the pieces. Um, do you want to? Sure. So with that also, uh, in terms of, again, re-emphasizing, focusing on your core competency so you can focus on innovating your customer experience, right? Also, re cost optimization by reducing operational overhead, leveraging this type of service. Also, increase ensuring that you increase your compliance, regulatory, uh, and uh, security compliance as well by leveraging this as a service. And there's no, and again, we want to emphasize there is no need to re-architect any existing uh, applications, and it also, in the end, helps you to further accelerate your overall cloud migration journey. So with that, wanted to say thank you.